Today's sermon is entitled, Believing and Treasuring God's Testimony. Our passage today is 1 John chapter 5, verses 6 through 8. Now, one commentator said that this is the most perplexing passage in 1 John. In fact, one of the most difficult in the New Testament. There are two reasons for that. First of all, we have a textual problem. I'm going to quickly deal with that before I even read the passage. And then the second problem has to do with this, the meaning of this phrase, water and blood. And I'm going to deal with that as we get into the sermon. So the textual problem in verses 7 and 8 is in the fact that from the New King James, all of verse 7 and the words in earth from verse 8 should be deleted. So if you have a New King James, you can see this very clearly. And I'm not disparaging that translation as a whole, but it definitely has a problem here. And it's a problem that many other modern versions have, have addressed, like the RSV, the NAS, the NIV, and of course the ESV that we're using today. But verse 7 from the New King James reads, For there are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, and these three are one. And there are three that bear witness, and here's this phrase, on earth. So all of verse 7 from the New King James with the words on earth in verse 8 needs to go away. Because the idea of the three heavenly witnesses, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, was written in the margin of some old Latin manuscript. And from there it was put into the text, being added to the Latin Vulgate around 800 AD. Well, now the original Vulgate, that was completed all the, back in the 5th century by Jerome, and that was a Latin translation of the Hebrew and the Greek uh, Bible, and it became the standard translation for the Bible for the Roman Empire and really the Latin-speaking West. But notice I said our verse and the wording in question was added much later, like 800. And, and you can see why the balancing words were added on earth that were in verse 8, because then you have three witnesses in heaven and three on earth. <clears throat> There's nothing wrong with three heavenly witnesses in themselves, of course. The point is simply they were not in the text as John wrote it, nor did they appear in any of the, the passage for several centuries after that. So how did this, this error, present only in the Latin manuscripts, get into our English text that are supposed to be based on Greek? Well, I'm glad you asked, and I'm dying to tell you if you didn't already know. It's an interesting story. At the time of the late Renaissance and Reformation, when classical texts were first being critically uh, edited and scholars were trying to deal with uh, variants from the extant copies that we have, well, uh, the guy named Erasmus of Rotterdam, he produced a Greek manuscript in, in which the words in verse 7 and the phrase in verse 8 were, were, were missing because he was following the Greek manuscripts that, that he had. But at this time, most of Europe was using the Latin Vulgate as a Bible version. So, so Erasmus was quickly criticized for omitting the passage, and he was intensely pressured by the Roman church to include it. Well, he ended up promising that he would include the words of verse 7 and the phrase in verse 8 in future editions if he could find a single Greek manuscript that contained it. Well, surprisingly, a copy was found. Wink, wink. Or I should say, you know, it was made to order. Because later they determined that this copy was actually written in Oxford around 1520, a year after the publication of Erasmus' second edition. And among the thousands of other Greek manuscripts that we have, only three attest to these heavenly witnesses. And they are all very, very late. One's from the 12th century, one's from the 16th, and one from the four, anywhere from the 14th to the 17th century. But either way... Very, very late manuscripts. <clears throat> but Erasmus knew that there was no valid evidence since the manuscripts of the passage probably came in because of the Latin text. Nevertheless, because he had promised that he would include the words in the third edition, that's what he did, and it was published in 1522. However, he did add a note where he expressed his belief that the, the new Greek manuscript had been written on purpose just to embarrass him. So what happened moving forward was Martin Luther used Erasmus Greek manuscript to translate 1 John into German, and then William Tyndale used it to translate it into English, and Erasmus text also became the basis for the Greek text by Stephanus in 1550. Well, Robert Etienne, known as Stephanus, he was a printer and an editor, and he edited and printed four editions. Uh, of the Textus, Textus Receptus, or the Received Text, 
from the period of 1546 to 1551. And that text is what produced the King James Version. So there's our church history lesson. Uh, now let's uh, pray and we'll get to our passage. Father, thank you for this portion of your word today. We ask for your help. Holy Spirit would be our teacher and that you would open this passage to our understanding. In Jesus' name, amen. 1 John 5, verses 6 through 8. This is he who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ, not by the water only, but by water and the blood. And the, and the Spirit is the one who testifies because the Spirit is the truth. For there are three that testify, the Spirit and the water and the blood, and these three agree. Amen. May God write the eternal truths of His Word upon your heart and mine. So in these verses, the Apostle John is addressing what is required as the sole object of saving faith. That is, we must believe in Jesus Christ in order to be saved. But in the truest sense, our faith doesn't save us. It is the object of our faith, Jesus Christ, who saves us. We do not save ourselves. Faith is merely God's instrument where He unites us to Christ. And so in this passage, John's concern is that we truly believe in the biblical Jesus Christ. And he's providing for us God's own testimony that we may do so. Now with every epistle in the New Testament, there's, there's this background of false teachers that had come into the church. And that should say something to us even today, that in churches around the world, there are false teachers and false teaching that has come into the church, and therefore the elders of, of, of the church and pastors of the church must be, must be vigilant. Because although a person may use the right vocabulary, that doesn't necessarily mean that they have the right meaning behind the words they're speaking. And that was the case here in, toward the end of the first century. And we think 1 John was written toward the end of the first century around the, in the 90s. Uh, so that gave a lot of time for false teachers like the Gnostics uh, to come into the church. And John's writing here to clarify true saving faith. Now recently we've been talking about God's testimony to us, the internal witness of the Holy Spirit, and then there's the external witness of the Word, which gives us some evidences or uh, fruit in our lives to help us discern whether or not we belong to the Lord. So in previous weeks we considered the internal witness of the new birth or, or regeneration, and then the external witness was that, well, when we are born again, we learned this from Scripture, when we're born again, we believe in Christ, we, believe, we love God, we love fellow believers, we obey God's commands, and we overcome the influences and the lies, the man manipulation of the evil world system. <clears throat> well, as we come to these verses, John is just continuing to describe the internal and external witness. Now, I've already explained the, the textual problem that we had. And the, and the story of Erasmus and why those verse, verses 7 and part of verse 8 are no longer included. Now we've got to deal with the second problem, which is the meaning of the phrase verse, in verse 6, that Jesus came by water and blood. And I promise the sermon is going to go quickly once we work through this problem. But what is, what is certain from this passage is that John is attempting to firmly establish the historical fact of the incarnation and the earthly life and ministry of Jesus Christ. But there are three positions here or ways to understand this phrase, He came by water and blood. Now all of them have some difficulties, but I think there's one that makes the most sense, and we'll talk about that. First of all, the, the reference to water and blood most naturally reminds us of the similar reference in John's Gospel where he calls attention to the blood and water that flowed from Christ's side after He was pierced with the spear of the Roman soldier after the crucifixion. And John puts some special emphasis on blood and water in his gospel and also here in this epistle. But the more you study those passages, the more you compare those emphases, the less similarities there, there, tend, there seem to be and the less light that one passage will shed on the other. And I'm not going to go through all those reasons, but if you look at it, you'll see what I mean. A second approach taken by the Reformers, as well as some of the moderns, is that water and blood refer to the two sacraments, you know, baptism and the Lord's Supper. Well, Calvin even pursued this line of thought in some detail. However, the difficulty with this view is that these symbols are not entirely appropriate because while water obviously may signify baptism, <clears throat> blood does not signify the Lord's Supper. It's, it's only one of the elements of the Supper. And then thirdly, and this is probably the most satisfactory solution, but not, not without some difficulty, is if you take the phrase, Jesus came by water as a reference to His baptism, and then He came by blood as a reference to His crucifixion or His death, 
Well, those are still surprising and strange word symbols for these events. But just because they're strange to us doesn't mean that they would have been necessarily strange to John's original audience. In fact, from John's use of them, it appears that they were not strange to them. And then there's two circumstances arising out of that context that support this view. First of all, John is obviously stressing the historical groundings of the faith in this passage. And if that's so, then an emphasis on Jesus' earthly ministry, where he uses baptism as a bookend on one end, as the initiation of it, and then his death as the other bookend, his crucifixion, well, that seems to be a reasonable way to bracket Jesus' ministry. What's more, at each of these events, Jesus' baptism and the crucifixion, God intervened in miraculous ways to bear witness to him and to verify that Jesus is who he said he is. He did that by voice at his baptism. He says, this is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. That's Matthew uh, chapter 3, verse 17. And then he did it by various miracles at the time of Jesus' crucifixion. I mean, Matthew 27, verses 51 and follows, I'm gonna, we, really, we read some amazing things. It says, Behold, the, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook, and the rocks were split, and tombs also were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised, and coming out of the tombs after His resurrection, they went into the holy city, and they appeared to many. And so He came in water, you know, if, if it represents that, His baptism starts His public ministry. And then he came in blood, or his crucifixion, uh, basically ends his public ministry. Although it's important to remember that Jesus' resurrection and his ascension were still key elements of the culmination of his ministry. So Jesus' earth, three-year earthly ministry, as it's recorded for us in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that was an external witness, an external testimony concerning who Jesus is. But that must be accompanied by the internal testimony of God, which is also always the Holy Spirit. Because, as Scripture teaches us concerning the new birth, and salvation is not merely an intellectual discipline. Now, it does involve the mind, and God converts His elect through the preaching of the Word. But it's not enough just to read the pages of the Bible, because every unbeliever is blinded by sin. They have a veil over their eyes. We're told that Satan has blinded the minds of unbelievers. Plus, you couple that with the fact that we're spiritually dead due to Adam's sin, and therefore we're helpless to believe unless and until God acts. And so the ob objective truth of the gospel must be accompanied by the internal ministry of the Holy Spirit. First of all, in regeneration, you know, to open our eyes, open our ears and our hearts, to convict us of sin, draw us to Christ, give us the uh, repentance and faith. And that's why John says these things must work together in conversion. And then also to give us assurance of our salvation throughout our Christian life. So it's the water, the blood, and the Spirit. And when we say the water and the blood, we're referring, of course, to G the person and work of Jesus Christ. The Christ of Scripture. And it's not just enough to intellectually sign off on that, you know, check a box, agree with it uh, intellectually. There has to be an internal witness, an internal testimony of the Holy Spirit as well. Well, that's the, the introduction. Uh, I'm basically giving you the lesson in the introduction, but we're just going to walk through these together for a few moments, these verses, and we're, and we're finished. So the first point, the first thing we see is we are to believe God's external testimony. That's the first half of verse 6. There's this outward objective testimony. Referring to Christ, John begins by saying, this is he, meaning that this is the only object of true saving faith. No one else, nothing else. Of course, the Son of God is mentioned at the end of the previous verse, too. So it's, it's right there in the immediate context. And there's only one door that leads to heaven. There's, there's only one way from this world into the presence of God, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. And so John is not saying that Jesus is one of many ways of saving faith. You know, he's saying he is the only way. He is the only object of saving faith. He, and he says this is one who, who came. And when he says that, he refers to the fact that Jesus came from heaven to enter this world. He, he entered the human race. And that in no way means that at his birth he actually came into existence. No, it just means that God took on human flesh and came into this world. He entered space and time from another world. 
And John's aim is to tell us that while Jesus came into this world for a specific purpose, he was going back to God. Notice how John describes it when he talks about it. And then as he records Jesus' own words, as he talks about it. So in John chapter 3, He who comes from above is above all. He who is of the earth belongs to the earth and speaks in an earthly way. He who comes from heaven is above all. And then Jesus answered, to his disciples, if I do bear witness about myself, my testimony is true, for I know where I came from and where I am going, but you do not know where I come from or where I'm going. And he, Jesus said, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hand, this is John saying this, and that he had come from God and was going back to God. So John is telling us, Jesus came from another realm, another world, and he entered into the human race. And you remember in the gospel account when Jesus began his public ministry, he goes to John the Baptist and Jesus tells John to baptize him. And I'm just going to read a portion of that from Matthew 3. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to John to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him saying, I need to be baptized by you. And do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, let it be so for now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he consented. And when Jesus was baptized, he immediately he went up from the water and behold, the heavens were opened to him. And he saw the spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. So obviously Jesus baptism was not a baptism of repentance. You know, that's what John had been preaching. He'd been saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand and baptizing people in the wilderness. He says, I baptize you with water for repentance. Well, the theological background here is that Adam represented us in the first covenant with God in the Garden of Eden, and he failed. And therefore, he brought sin and spiritual death to himself and all his progeny. Therefore, according to God's plan, Jesus represented us in the new covenant to come and accomplish salvation for us. So he takes the mark of God's people upon himself. That's all baptism really is. You're taking the mark of God's people upon yourself. And it was baptism which is the sign that would replace circumcision in the Old Testament. And of course, Jesus has no personal need for any ritual cleansing or any sign pointing to any reality because Jesus himself is the reality. He's representing God's elect, so he has John baptize him. And as John writes here in 1 John uh, about Jesus coming by water, John is the last living apostle at this point, and probably hardly anyone else is even still alive who was there that day at the Jordan River when Jesus was baptized. And so whoever is a believer at this point is dependent upon the testimony of the apostles written in God's Word. The other three Synoptic Gospels have already been written by this point, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and, and, then, uh, and then John, of course. And, and all that to say, God's Word is God's testimony. He's speaking through His Word. And as I mentioned in the introduction, God attended that baptism and he testified by voice from heaven. That's a very significant defining moment. As God the Father is testifying from heaven, this is my son uh, in whom I'm well pleased. You, you need to listen to him. You, know, you need to believe in him. And then as baptism, Holy Spirit, notice, also descends and testifies. He, he testifies by descending upon Jesus like a dove. He's signifying, testifying that Jesus is the anointed Messiah of whom the prophets spoke. So Jesus' baptism identifies the beginning of his public ministry. He came by water. And then John adds, and blood, pointing to his crucifixion. Part of the culmination of his earthly ministry, because as I said a minute ago, the resurrection and ascension were also the final parts of that culmination. Very important. And John mentions the blood here representing the entirety of his death on our behalf. And so the mention of that blood should really draw our attention to the importance of the blood of Christ. So we'll talk just for a moment about the merits of the blood of Jesus. First of all, there's forgiveness of sins. Matthew 26, Jesus said, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for, for many for the forgiveness of sins. The only way for us to have our sins washed away is by the blood of the Lord Jesus. There, there is power in His blood to forgive sin. The second is redemption from bondage because we were held captive by our sins and really by Satan in chains of darkness. And the blood of Christ through justification has released us from the dominating power of sin in our life. We still have sin's influence to deal with, but the dominating power has been broken 
And, and to be redeemed means to be rescued from this slavery of darkness. 1 Peter 1.18, knowing that you were, trans, you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, here it is, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. So he released us from the penalty of our sin by his blood. And then Ephesians 1.7, in him we have redemption through his blood. So the blood of Christ has set us free from our former bondage. Thirdly, the blood of Christ has reconciled us to God. It's brought to us a personal relationship with God, brought us into that. In Colossians 1.20, Paul writes, For in Him, in Christ, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through Him to reconcile to Himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of His cross. And so praise God for the, for the shed blood of Christ. And then fourthly, there's this cleansing from sin, synonymous with forgiveness. 1 John 1, 7, the blood of Jesus, notice, cleanses us from all sin. And just to finish this out, fifth, the blood of Christ has brought propitiation. Well, that propitiation means satisfaction or appeasement, or that it has placated God. God the Father's wrath toward us has been satisfied by the blood of Christ. You know, once God was angry with us, but if you're trusting in Jesus Christ, God is no longer angry toward you because of the blood of Christ. And therefore, Romans 3.25 says there is propitiation in His blood. That's how important the blood of Christ is. Sixthly and finally, we're sanctified by His blood. Hebrews 13.12 So Jesus also suffered outside the gate in order to sanctify the people through His own blood. That's what this says. Through the shedding of blood... For His people, not only have we been justified, not only have we been put in right standing before God positionally, but we've also been set apart from our former way of life and the stranglehold, the dominating power of sin has been broken in our lives. Yes, we still sin. Yes, we still have to deal with sin's influence. But we've been set apart unto God. And all of this is found in the blood of Christ. So John begins, and we just covered a lot here, but... He, 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 we must believe in the external witness and the, in the external testimony of God concerning His Son that Jesus came by water and blood. But secondly, married with that, in the second part, half of verse 6, we must rely on the assurance of God's internal testimony. It's not enough just to intellectually, cognitively agree with these facts. The devil knows these facts. The, the demons know these facts. That's not going to get you to heaven you, just that you have it in your head, there has to be this internal testimony of God the Holy Spirit to bring this home to your heart with power to reveal to you your need for the blood of Christ. As we've already seen, that's the result of the new birth. And, you know, along with that, repentance, faith, and we've been studying this for the last couple of weeks. This is why he now says it's the Spirit who testifies because the Spirit is the truth. So in this context, the testimony of Holy Spirit obviously refers to the personal work of Jesus. That as we hear the truth about Christ, as we read the truth about God and, and the Holy Spirit brings this powerful witness into our inner soul. He says to us, this is the very truth of God. You need to believe this right now. And the third person of the Trinity, this is the Holy Spirit, is co-equal, co-eternal with the Father and the Son. He brings this internal witness. He initially he regenerates us, gives us the gift of faith and repentance. And then he seals us unto eternal life. And then for the remainder of our Christian life, He guides us and He witnesses to our heart that we truly belong to God. So the ministry of the Holy Spirit is huge. And that's why John mentions the Holy Spirit here to bring this powerful testimony to our inner soul. And when you were converted, you, you probably didn't know a whole lot of theology. I know I certainly didn't. So how did I believe? Well, Holy Spirit took what little I knew when I heard the gospel preached and He affirmed to my heart that Christ is the only Savior and, and, and that I was a huge sinner and that I needed to put my trust in the Lord Jesus. And that I couldn't uh, explain, even though I couldn't explain any doctrines at that point, I did not need a library full of arguments to convince me. Holy Spirit was the one who converted me. And I didn't even realize the Holy Spirit was doing it. But now as I study the Bible and as I look back at my life, I see the Holy Spirit just invaded my soul and brought with him the truth of the water and the blood. You know, the, por the person and work of Jesus Christ. And he testified to me that I needed to believe in Christ with the gift of faith and, 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 grant to, and, and grace to repent. 
So Holy Spirit brought irrefutable evidence to my mind, my heart, that the gospel is true. And every day since then, he continues to bear witness in my heart that this is God's truth. So it's the Spirit who testifies because the Spirit is true. So God the Father is truth. Jesus is the truth. The Spirit is truth. And the reason He can bear witness to the truth is because He is the truth. So quickly then, and this is, this is really what happened on the day of Pentecost. I mean, Peter stood up when he preached and he, get, he gave this external te testimony. He started going through the Old Testament. He started saying, you know, Joel chapter 2. He's quoting from there. And he's saying, what you're seeing right now, this is what... Joel was referring to. And then Psalm 16 and Psalm 110. This is the external testimony of God in His written Word. And then Holy Spirit, He brought that external testimony home to the hearts of 3,000 people that day. That Jesus is the only Savior. That that's why it's necessary that we preach the gospel today and we witness to others. That Holy Spirit may do whatever He will and accomplish God's purposes in the world as we, as we preach the gospel. Thirdly and finally, we have to believe and treasure God's united testimony. So John just now, he kind of puts a ribbon or a bow around what he's just said in verse 7. He says, for there are three who testify. And I think this threefold witness really is pointing us back to the Old Testament where like in Deuteronomy 17, it says, you know, a matter can only be verified by two or three witnesses. And it's repeated in the New Testament in 1 Timothy 5:19. But what John is doing here, he's pulling all this together, what he just said, and he's join, joining them together in an inseparable manner. And so in verse 8, the spirit, that's the internal witness, and the water and the blood, that's the external. He says, these agree. That means one united testimony as opposed to conflicting testimonies. These things speak with one voice. They testify to the same truth. And now we understand why these verses are following what we saw for the last couple of weeks in verses 1 through 5. So I'll conclude by saying this is why the sin of unbelief is such a heinous sin. In fact, unbelief is judgment. I mean, I hope to do a sermon on that subject before we finish 1 John, but the sin of unbelief calls God a liar. John says that the, that very thing in verse 10 here, as we'll see next time, whoever does not believe God has made him a liar because he has not believed in the testimony that God has borne concerning his Son. So if you reject this testimony, you are shaking your fist in God's face. You're trying to indict God as a liar. So when someone is in unbelief, they are not in a state of neutrality. It's not as if they're just riding the, the fence and they're indifferent. You know? they're, they're not in no man's land. No, they're in very dangerous territory. The Bible says they're condemned already in that state. They've declared themselves to be God's enemy. They've rejected His clear testimony and His Word by Holy Spirit. So if God's speaking to you today through His Word, then just, just simply go to Him. Uh, agree with God about what He has said about us, that, that you're a sinner, you cannot save yourself, and then ask Him to forgive you and put your trust in Jesus, and, and you will be saved. Father, thank You today for this portion of Your Word, and we ask that You will uh, uh, cause it to accomplish Your purposes, not only in Your kingdom, but really in all our individual lives. And we ask that in Jesus' name. Amen.